Good morning, church. How are you all doing today? Great. I like that answer. Well, let me start with a question. Why today perhaps you are anxious? What is the sort of anxiety that you have today? Because we all do. I had an outstanding week, an awesome week, but I was anxious. Last weekend, uh, we celebrated Easter, Easter weekend, right? And we had a, a concert for the Spanish service here. And then we had uh, the this Lord's Supper uh, services in the sanctuary. Then we have on Sunday, we had all these services going on. It was crazy. And then I joined the uh, uh, mission trip to South Texas. It's kind of my home away from home. And uh, from Wednesday to like yesterday, I don't know how many times I was able to convey the message and uh, preach and teach conferences. Some of these leaders wanted to stay there like for a long time. And then I noticed that in the calendar I had to preach three services today. <laughs> so God has a sense of humor, right? Uh, a bit anxious to talk about anxiety. You know, that's the way it works. It's just, it's just God. So we live in a society that suffers of anxiety every single day. We are, in a sense, anxious people. Do you know that for every generation over the last century, people in the United States have been three times more likely to struggle with anxiety or depression than the preceding generation? Basically, we are tripling our cases with anxiety and depression with every generation. We are anxious about so many things. For example, students early in school, they start getting anxious about how the day will look like, right? Uh, even in elementary, then middle school, uh, then high school, then you graduate, and then you become anxious about where do I go to college? Am I gonna get accepted to the school that I always wanted? Once you get to college, college life, awesome years, we always remember those. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Then you graduate and you say, well, finally, dad and mom, I'm so proud. You walk through the ceremony. You are so proud. You have this degree now. And then you start looking for the job that you always wanted. And then sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. You get the job, hopefully. Then you start thinking about getting married. If you didn't get married right after college, I did that. <laughs> uh, that's what I have a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old. You know, I don't look like that. Right yeah. I started early, early, early. <laughs> the other day I went to a, uh, to a place and they said, okay, are you a college student? No, she's my daughter. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyways, I close parenthesis to say, <laughs> do you feel anxious at times? Okay, you finish college, then you get married, and then did I marry the right person? You start having problems. I had my first argument with my wife when we went in the honeymoon. I never saw my parents arguing. So when we had this little argument about something, the car rental, you know, it's like, I, I felt like I was failing already. Hmm. Then you get a job, am I gonna get promoted? Am I gonna get sufficient money? And then once you get married and then to decide if you have children or not. And then you start thinking about how those children will turn out to be. Are they gonna resemble mom? Thankfully, my kids, you know, her genes are just helping a little bit. <laughs> and then you start thinking about, are they gonna resemble like my great uncle that he was so rude? You start, you, you, you just start thinking about so many things and we become anxious and worry about Life, do you feel like that at times? Maybe you feel like this right now, and I think many of us do, and I look around people's faces, I have conversations with them, and there is a heaviness with all kinds of anxieties in life. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And today, we are in the journey through the book or the gospel of Matthew, and we have entitled this sermon series, The Gospel According to Jesus, King Jesus. And today, perhaps, I'm going to read over you 
some verses from Jesus, the King of Kings, and he talks about anxiety. And we find this in the Sermon of the Mount. The Sermon of the Mount has all these teachings in about 110 verses, and 10 of them are devoted to anxiety. King Jesus, talking to us, 21st century, apply it today. This is what the word of God says. Is there on the screen? So you don't feel anxious about looking for it. <laughs> oh, you didn't bring the Bible. Is there? <laughs> is there? It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we where? For pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And then the famous verse with the preacher voice. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. What a wonderful passage. You know, Jesus Christ is telling us here three times. I don't know if you notice. Verse 25, do not be anxious. In verse 31, he says, do not be anxious. Then in verse 34, he says, therefore, do not be anxious. Then now, Jesus commands us not to be anxious. And the question that surfaces is, why do we do completely the opposite? The simple answer is that we have a natural tendency to worry about life. The dictionary defines anxious as experiencing worry, unease, nervousness, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Another definition says, Wanting something very much, like you want to eat, right? Typically with a feeling of unease, so we get the unease part. Then to make it more complicated, the American Psychological Association defines anxiety as an emotion characterized by a feeling of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure that then leads into anxiety disorders characterized by states of excessive uneasiness and apprehension, often with compulsive behavior or panic attacks. You're getting anxious already. It gets worse. Signs of anxiety include irritability, anger, sweating, unusual mood swings, rapid heartbeat, chest pain, exhaustion, nervous twitching, Decreased concentration and memory, nausea, shortness of breath, hair loss, weight, etc. And you say, I'm anxious then. <laughs> I'm assuming that many people are familiar with some of these signs to varying degrees. If you pull all these together, just trying to figure out the definition of anxiety gives you a little bit of anxiety. For example, someone may have a clinical anxiety, which is a medical condition that includes some of the side effects I just mentioned. So when you hear Jesus say to his disciples, do not be anxious, as though he's commanding them not to be anxious, he's not referring to clinical anxiety. Then to make things more complicated, the apostle Paul talks about anxiety in good terms. 
In 2 Corinthians, he mentions about the good anxiety that he has about the churches. He cares about the churches. And he also mentions that in Philippians chapter 2. He's concerned about them. This is the genuine concern. And it is good sometimes to have that. So what does Jesus mean when he says, do not be anxious? What does anxiety mean in this context? Well, here is my best attempt to define it. Anxiety and worry are often used interchangeably in the scriptures. When you see the original Greek work and all these things that the theologians sitting in there will probably be looking at, yes, yes, worry. So let's replace anxiety in this context with worry. So the definition that I put here, so you can hashtag Rolando Aguirre, is anxiety is caring concerns in this world in such a way that we lose perspective on life, and we lack trust in God. Let me repeat it again. Anxiety is caring concerns in this world in such a way that we lose perspective on life and we lack trust in God. So anxiety is being worried about the concerns in life in this context, right? It is good to be concerned about life, yes, but the problem comes when we carry our concerns in such a way that we lose perspective on life and we lack trust in God. So this is what Jesus desires to free us from in Matthew chapter 6. When we define it this way, I trust that you realize it is exactly the kind of anxiety we are tempted to have every single day. So today, we're going to talk about this passage. Let me give you some points because I'm very deductive and inductive and narrative at the same time. I'm that type of preacher. You're trying to determine who, what. Okay. Our life is valuable. Okay. Our life is valuable. Verse 25 and 26, it says, you know, that we are valuable in him. However, we struggle with our temporary concerns. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about life what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? What Jesus says in verse 25 is so interesting. Just think about those things Jesus mentions. Food, drink, and clothes. These are very basic needs, right? So Jesus is not saying that you have to worry about the car that you drive or how many Instagram followers you have or you know, the desires or wants, you, Jesus is not talking about those things. Jesus is talking about the real deal, basic needs. So why not worry about them? Because your life is more than food. <laughs> your body is more than clothing. And your life is about more than what you eat or what you realize other people think about you. You are valuable to God. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, you're getting excited, yes. Your life is more about uh, than what other people think about you. Your life is more than what the school that you graduated from or the job that you have, the possessions that you have, the training that you have. Your life is valuable because Christ died on the cross for our sins and he has given us a new life, a new purpose, and a new meaning. That's what our life is valuable. It doesn't depend on circumstances. It depends on God. Then he talks about our eternal value. You know, look at the birds <laughs> of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So what is our life about? Jesus explained this very simple yet profound principle. Very key. He says, Look at the birds. You know, who would have thought that the antidote to anxiety is bird washing? <laughs> yeah, Jesus, in a village, he says, okay, behold, look at the birds. <laughs> you laugh, but that's the way it went. And this is, this is the memoir. This is the, the teaching behind it. He says, Birds are not concerned about what they're going to eat or what's going to happen to them. I, I don't think the birds are looking on CNN, on the news on thoughts, or 
mm, articles about what's going on. They, they're not worried about that. They know that the creator will provide for them. And Jesus plainly stated, he's telling them, just look at the birds. I, I created the birds, but you are more valuable than the birds. You are my maximum extreme creation. You are created according to my image, image deo. We have God's imprint in us. You are more valuable than they are. So, bird washing. Next time you feel anxious, just look at the birds. They're not worrying, right? Jesus says, you know, look at them. Our worry is unhelpful our, our is also, and is also ineffective in this context. Verse 27 and 32, you might question why. Because worrying doesn't make things better. Our worry is unhelpful and ineffective because worrying doesn't make things better. Verse 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? There is uh, an study on these words here. You know, can you add the chronos time in this life by worrying? The answer is no. No. It's like this lady that the other day, the other day she told me, Pastor, I'm worrying today because I am not worried about anything. So I worry because something is coming up. <laughs> I say, give thanks to the Lord. You know, we all struggle with that. I struggle with that. Maybe you can join www.worrytomuch.com. Like me, right? We can probably have a support group in there. Let me tell you, what are some of the things that we worry about the most? These are one of the ones, you know, there are many, but... I just want to mention some of them. We worry about the sins of the past. This is a typical one. We worry about the sins of the past. All the mistakes, all the problems, all the situations God is telling us today. Our sins have been forgiven. Jesus Christ paid on the cross for all of our sins, our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. And you and I don't have to be worrying about it. There is a prophetic word. In the book of Psalms, I, I love the book of Psalms. It says, Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. The word transgressions, we just only read it in the Bible, that means mistakes. He has removed every mistake, everything that will make you feel guilty about. Second, we worry about the successes of the past. All oh, those glorious days. I remember 20, 30 years ago. I even do the accent, right? I'm Colombian, by the way, so that's where my accent is coming from. Um, but I speak like a South Texan. That's my home. Um, so if I throw some Spanish in between, I'm sorry. That's, that's 20 years in South Texas. Some of you that went down there, is, that's, that's the life, right? You're speaking English and Spanish that you don't even know <laughs> what you're saying sometimes. So we worry about the successes of the past. Sometimes it's good to, to remember the good things. God has been working in my heart. You know, I come from a, from a service that was packed from a congregation, from the Spanish service that was full. And coming and relaunching, uh, it's been tough. <laughs> You get a, a heart check. What are your motives sometimes? You, we worry about that. That's good. God used you, but then this is the moment now. Oh, before COVID. Yes, COVID. COVID is still existing, but okay, let's move forward. Amen? Amen? We worry about yesterday's regrets. What we said or didn't say or what we did or didn't do where we needed to be, I have some of those. I mean, you all do. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> we worry about today and about tomorrow. We worry so much. We have so many things to do. My mom died when I was 12, and, and uh, my wife tells me that I live my life in a fast track. I'm always thinking about everything that comes after. 
because of the fragility of life. She died when she was 40. I'm, I'm there. So I live like that. I worry sometimes too much. The reality is that you and I will not accomplish anything or add anything to our chronos or kairos. This time and eternal value, God's timing by worrying. It's ineffective. So put it in this perspective. Jesus is saying, look at the lilies and the grass. Okay, from the birds to the lilies and the grass. We went to South Texas and there's still some fields and we went to pray for this place that we are trusting God that there will be a building there for, um, for Hartford kids and a distribution center. So we, we, we pray for that land. But what Jesus is saying, of course, many years ago, he's saying, look at the grass. I mean, lilies, they're wonderful, but that they will die tomorrow, perhaps. But then tomorrow, there will be another lily looking as beautiful as this one. Not even Solomon, in all his splendor, is able to do that. Because God, God provides. God is, is, is concerned about his creation. So, Jesus is saying, why are you worried about your paycheck? You have to work, okay? When God will give you the whole earth as your inheritance? Why are you worried about your position at work? You can work, and that's great. When God is going to give you his reign also in the future? Why are you worried about your health? You have to take care of your health. I understand that. Stewardship. When God will give you himself eternal life, we worry too much. This passage also says that worrying too much is for unbelievers. Okay, uh, I don't like that, Pastor Orlando. Hmm. I, I like that, the other part, but not this one. For the pagans run after all these things. So there is a connotation here. There is a contrast, right? If you pursue the things of this world, you will never be satisfied. You know what's the, the son that was uh, the most popular son in the last 100 years? I cannot get satisfaction. By who? The Rolling Stones. Oh, they know. I cannot get satisfaction. I cannot get satisfaction. That's the only thing it says. When I'm driving in my car, uh, I don't remember. I mean, that's not from my generation. <laughs> why, why do you think, you know, it's, okay, it, it's an illustration. Let's bring it here to, to the contents. Because in this world, on this side of eternity, there is nothing that will satisfy us. I, I've been in ministry for 17 years, and uh, I've done some funerals, and uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard from anybody that is about to die to ask me, Pastor, just, just look at, um, at my bank statement one more time. I just want to go with that memory in my mind. No. Just, 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 just uh, through the window, I want to see my car one more time. No. It's always relationships. It's always God's timing. It's always what they didn't do for the kingdom. It's always my kids. It's always my spouse. It's always what is transcendent. And today, God is reminding us, okay, look first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. That's what the Bible is saying so what do we do? Because I like the orthodoxy, but I also like the orthopraxy. Trust that your father, God, my Abba, father, my papito, knows all that I need. The verse 32b says, and your father knows that you need them all. God knows it all. Jesus is saying God knows every single thing. Being each one, each one of us needs right now better than we even know it. Can I say that one more time? Listen, Christian, today, brother and sister, God knows it all. He knows your need, your pain, what you're going through. He knows it. He's not up in heaven saying, I wonder what he needs or she needs. He knows it. Secondly, trust that your father will supply all that you need. He not only knows, but he will supply everything that we need. 
You know, we, we uh, study this verse. Uh, if you grew up in church, you heard it so many times. Preachers saying, but seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you as well. <laughs> amen. Gotta get out of the Oh, glory to Jesus. Right? I can't do that. Eh? Um, but that's not who I am. <laughs> so um, I'm a Colombian with an accent and, and you, you have to understand me, okay? In the context of anxiety, in the context of being overly concerned, it is in the context of the eternal versus the temporary. It is in the context of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, now, if you seek God's rule, God's control in your heart in such a way that he will control every aspect of your life, if you seek first that, then everything else will be added to you as well. It is in that context that we now understand that, yes, we worry about the earth, you know, we worry about the, the, the temporary, we worry about so many other things, but God is reminding us today, our perspective is eternal, but we have to be good stewards on this side of eternity. Trust that God, your father, will supply everything that you need. He knows everything that you need. He knows your job. If you need a husband or a wife, or if you don't need one, it's okay. I mean, God knows, right? He knows everything. Trust that your father will provide enough grace for today. This is a good one. Please highlight it right there. Trust that your father will provide enough grace for today and enough wisdom for tomorrow. Enough grace for today and enough wisdom for tomorrow. Therefore, do not be anxious, worry, overly concerned about temporary things. That's the definition. In such a way that you lack trust in Jesus. Okay, that's anxiety, the definition. About tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There is another translation that says, we have enough problems for today, period. How many agree with that? We do. We have enough with today. Okay, this is key for life. Jesus himself, the king of kings, is giving us this advice. Okay, I will give you enough grace for today and wisdom for tomorrow. So tomorrow there will be new mercies for new problems, but today will be enough. There is this song that we always sing in South Texas in funerals, um, in English and Spanish, they say, one day at a time with Jesus. And it's like, uh, like a Mexican thing, you know, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. And people is crying, it's all I want from you. And people is connected to, to the lyrics, right? Give me the strength. And people is just like, oh, like, this is so moving and touching. But then after the funeral, we forget about it. We have to leave one day at a time. Two simple teachings. Do not focus on your past and do not focus on tomorrow. So... I can add anything else for today. The mercies God gives today are not designed to carry the burdens that might come tomorrow. Let me repeat it again. The mercies God gives today are not designed to carry the burdens that might come tomorrow. God's mercies today are designed to carry today's problems. And he has new mercies every single day. The supply line for Jesus never runs out. You thought it was Amazon until you order um, toilet paper two years ago and you didn't receive anything. <laughs> God's supply line never runs out. He never runs out of love, compassion, mercy, power. He never runs out. He is our God. He is our King. He is our Lord. Today, we have an opportunity to interview an expert on the mental health. Dr. Brad Schull, I told him that I was anxious about pronouncing his last name more than the sermon. So I told him, don't, don't take it personal. Dr. Brad Schull, how am I doing? You're doing great. Okay, thank you. Perfect. He's not a stranger of our uh, church. He's, he's been here for so many years. He was part of the staff and, and he's now the CEO of the Center for Integrative Counseling and Psychology 
We have a partnership with this center here at our church, so if you didn't know, please know today. And Brad, as believers, we all struggle with anxiety and worry. So how do I know when it is just a normal day-to-day worry and anxiety, and then when it's a clinical anxiety that I must look for help? We are looking for intensity and duration. So normal to have those day-to-day stressors. Uh, Then we hit those bumps in the road, life transitions. Anxiety is when we have those symptoms you mentioned earlier, the racing thoughts, the worry about the future or the worry about the past. And they are at an intense level lasting over time, impacting various areas of our life. So when they begin, those, that, that worry, those racing thoughts begin to creep into all aspects of our life and our loved ones are noticing that we're irritable because anxiety and depression, there's a lot of different emotions that go mm-hmm. along with those, like irritability, uh, like, like that worry or fear, as well as those low moods. So when that's pervasive and the depth and breadth of those thoughts uh, impact our lives in a deep way, then we know we might need to step back and get support. So, thank you. So as believers, um, we always have this balance, right? Do I don't have faith if I feel anxious, right? Or uh, I, I just have a little faith? Or how do I know uh, how to cope with that? I mean, uh, when, when I feel like, you know, sometimes we're worried and uh, as believers, you know, I have a strong faith, and some of my brothers and sisters do have that, but how do I face that a stigma and that guilt yeah. is the word? Yeah. So stigma among Christians uh, starts with two, I would say, irrational uh, beliefs, misbeliefs. Uh, one would be that if we are depressed or anxious, it must be that we just don't have enough faith. Hmm. Um, the second is we, we look around at work, uh, at school, here at church, and it looks like people are doing great and things are good. And so in our minds, we think, oh, they need to be good. I'm, I, I have to look good. And we avoid what might be hurting. Now, just as uh, we sometimes think, oh, I should have more faith or I don't have enough faith, faith gives support. Connect groups in this church are a network of support. And the more that we can be open, uh, the better we are at being the church and providing support. So, so recognizing that mental health is a health issue. There's biochemistry. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly there's our past. But mental health is a health issue. And, and that belief, and also the belief that our faith can help, uh, can help us to heal and to be well. So this is my family um, for two years. I guess I, I passed the test after two years. They haven't fired me. Um, but so many years ago, fifth, 17 years ago, I was um, just recently married and had a job. My wife was pregnant, and uh, I was pursuing my master's degree. And I remember I had this chest pain, and I had these issues going on in my body. And as men, we don't like to go to a doctor. How many men say amen, which is totally wrong? I didn't tell my wife. Uh, so that happened for consecutive weeks. One day I decided to stop uh, in Far Texas and visit Dr. Iglesias. And she told me, Rolando, you are experiencing a panic attack. And he, she prescribed uh, Letzapro. And she says, there is no way I can let you leave this place without this medication. You have to prove me in three months. You come and, and you have to you know, change some patterns in your life. It was the first time that I dealt with anxiety. Um, after that, by the grace of God, I was able to cope with it. How do we know that that stigma mm-hmm. of looking for help or perhaps medication, right, will help us? I mean, and it's okay. It's okay to, to, to do that. How, how would you say, how would you add to that? Well, one, you setting an example by being open and Mm -hmm. genuine and real, and I've loved hearing you speak this morning. Uh, Two, recognizing that we go to uh, the doctor, we go take care of our heart. Uh, The same thing can be done uh, for our psychological health, our our emotional uh, well-being. 
And so that, that vulnerability and then seeking that support that God does give us while recognizing God's presence. Hmm. If you have a kid who's struggling, if you're struggling, we have to have patience because sometimes uh, if we're dealing with depression or anxiousness or an ongoing stress, it takes time. Hmm. But our therapists at the center who are here at the church uh, are focused on not just looking at emotional well-being, but also spiritual well-being. And so we believe uh, that the best way that we can heal and recover is to combine that focus on mind, body, as well as spirit. And I believe when we do, uh, we can grow closer to God. Amen. We can have a depth of relationship with Christ, recognizing that Christ is with us no matter what. And that can help us live the abundant life, the full life that Christ does promise us. So there's always hope. Uh, be of support. Recognize that it, it is okay uh, to reach out. And we will face changes and challenges. It doesn't often even matter what's going on in our lives around us. Either. Last year, I remember a title of our sermon was, It's Okay Not to Be Okay. Yep. Dr. Brad Scholl, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. So now... The antidote to anxiety is prayer. You know, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, uh, just let it sink for a moment. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is basically saying, do not be anxious about everything by praying for everything. There is not an easy fix on this. It's not. It's not a simple prayer, but it's a disposition of your heart. And perhaps these are some simple steps. You could replace worry or anxiety by worshiping God today. God, you are in control. I know that you have all power. You are all knowing. You know my needs. You know my future. I worship you. Taking the focus of your needs to worship the Lord. Second, abiding in Christ. You abide in him. It's like you cling into his promises. What is really transcendent? It is the promises of Jesus. I will be with you. There's this thematic, you know, subject in the Bible. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. John is looking in the book of Revelations in the island of Patmos, and he's looking at the future, and he's looking at the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Adopting our identity in Christ. We are not defined by our circumstances or by our problems or situations, we are defined by Jesus Christ. Our story, spiritual speaking, is narrated. It departs from the cross of Jesus Christ. When you narrate it or you relate it to that, things and perspective will change. Living in the present in light of eternity. Yes, we are here, but we are like a flower. We'll die. <laughs> we are dying but we have eternal life and value through Jesus Christ. And seeking first the kingdom of God. You know, can you worry about trusting in God every day of your life? Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So today, I know you might not be used to this, but we're gonna do something different. Can you please stand up? Stand on your feet. While we sing a song, we all need help. We all need a little bit more of the presence of Jesus in our lives. And I'm gonna open up the altar here. I know we have some different things here, but I'm gonna calm down because I need so much of Jesus too. And while we sing a song, you come, you come up forward, and, and it's just an expression of saying, Lord, I need so much of you. I want to leave it at the cross. 
You can do it where you are, but if you want to come and join me, don't leave me by myself. <laughs>